Spider webs, eye spots, and birds in nested hierarchies. Well, first I should probably explain to you what nested hierarchies are. <coughs> I take this from a, um, a site in um, evolution.berkeley.edu and um, it talks about nested hierarchies. Uh, I'm going to give you two examples, but I'm going to tell you that these are only representative of a large number of other different people at different times, uh, blogs, um, whatever, that will all tell you the same thing. <coughs> the, um, uh, the site is entitled Nested Hierarchies, and it starts out, common ancestry is conspicuous. Evolution predicts that living things will be related to one another in what scientists refer to as nested hierarchies, rather like nested boxes. Groups of related organisms share suites of similar characteristics, and the number of shared, straight, uh, shared traits increases with relatedness. This is indeed what we observe in the living world and in the fossil record, and those relation these relationships can be illustrated, as shown below. And that's the illustration that they give. You'll notice that snakes and lizards are closely related to each other. Crocodiles and birds are closely related to each other, according to this thing. And um, that all of them uh, come from a reptilian uh, group. Now, interestingly enough, this is not the way it's supposed to have happened, because, in fact, the whales, camels, humans, and chimpanzees form what they call a crown group. This is being a little over uh, simplistic. He needs to put the birds together with crocodiles because birds are dinosaurs, and if if you don't, if you can't make that case, then uh, it's difficult to know where to put birds. Um, in fact, as as most of you know, birds and mammals and Reptiles are all considered three different uh, families. Uh, pardon me, um, is it orders? They're not phyla. Classes, Classes yes. Uh, but um, but they're trying to make a point that crocodile, crocodiles are more closely related birds than crocodiles are related to snakes and lizards which is not the traditional way of looking at things, but um, they're really trying to shoehorn birds into the uh, reptilian area. Uh, <coughs> in this phylogeny, snakes and lizards share a large number of traits as they are most, more closely related to one another than to the other animals represented. The same can be said of crocodiles and birds, whales and camels, and humans and chimpanzees. However, at a more inclusive level, Snakes, lizards, birds, crocodiles, whales, camels, chimpanzees, and humans all share some common traits that, for example, are not shared by fish, or more importantly, are not shared by such things as starfish or, um, or oysters. Humans and chimpanzees are united by many shared inherited traits, such as 98.7% of their DNA. Those of you who've been here before will smile at that number a little bit. Um, but at a more inclusive level of life's hierarchy, we share a smaller set of inherited traits in common with all primates. More inclusive still, we share traits in common with other mammals, other vertebrates, other animals. At the most inclusive level, we sit alongside sponges, petunias, diatoms, and bacteria in a very large box entitled living organisms. And this is intended to be something that if you are an elementary or secondary teacher, you can actually teach this. And so there's a little place to click teach this lesson plans for teaching about phylogeny. So this is supposed to get into the um, um, uh, not only undergraduate, but um, high school or less education. And sure enough, it has left its mark in a number of places, including in talk origins, as you will notice here. Um, this is, of course, not the entire uh, talk origins thing, but you'll notice that prediction 1.2 is a nested hierarchy of species. 
As seen from the phylogeny in figure one, which is in the background here, the predicted pattern of organisms at any given point in time can be described as groups within groups, otherwise known as a nested hierarchy. The only known process that specifically generate unique nested hierarchical patterns are branching evolutionary processes. That's a rather staggering statement, um, given that human designs often will, will form nested hierarchies. Not always, but often. Common descent is a genetic process in which the state of the present generation individual is dependent not only on genetic changes that have occurred, uh, pardon me, is dependent only on genetic changes that have occurred since the most recent ancestral population or individual. Therefore, gradual evolution from common ancestors, uh, now he has just gotten through saying that evolution is the only thing that can produce, produce nested hierarchies. We've raise questions about that. It goes on to say, therefore gradual evolution from common ancestors must conform to the mathematics of Markov processes and Markov chains. Using Markovian mathematics, it can be rigorously proven that branching Markovian replicating systems produce nested hierarchies. So now he's not only making the claim, which I think is a rather strong win, that uh, only evolutionary processes can produce nested hierarchies. But he's also making the claim that only um, that, that evolution must always produce nested hierarchies. Which is a rather strong claim if you think about it. Um, but perhaps he's right. In fact, I'd like to assume he's right. For these reasons, biologists routinely use branching Markov chains to effectively model evolutionary processes, including complex genetic processes, the temporal distributions of surnames in populations, and the behavior of pathogens in epidemics. The nested hierarchical organization of special, uh, pardon me, of species contrasts sharply with other possible biological patterns such as the continuum of the great chain of being and the continuums pre predicted by Lamarck's theory of organic progression. And notice one of the references to that is Darwin, 1872. And then Futuma, 1998, pages 88 to 92. Mere similarity between organisms is not enough to support macroevolution. The nested classification pattern produced by a branching evolutionary process, such as common descent, is much more specific than simple similarity. Real world examples that cannot be objectively classified in nested hierarchies are the elementary particles, which are described by quantum chromodynamics, the elements whose organization is described by quantum mechanics and is illustrated by the periodic table, the planets in our solar system, books in a library, are specially designed objects like building, furnish, furniture, cars, etc. Although I can imagine dividing vehicles into two-wheeled, four-wheeled, three-wheeled, etc. and finding similarities and possibly even depending on what you look at in nested hierarchy goes on to say, although it is triv trivial to classify anything subjectively in a hierarchical matter, manner, only certain things can be classified objectively in a consistent, unique, nested hierarchy. The difference drawn here between subjective and objective is crucial and requires some elaboration and is best illustrated by example. Different models of cars certainly could be classified hierarchically. Perhaps one could classify cars first by color, then within each color by a number of wheels, then within each wheel number uh, by manufacturer, etc. Well, perhaps if we reverse that and did it by manufacturer, and then by body style, and then by color finally, might make more sense. <coughs> However, another individual may classify the same cars first by manufacturer, then by size, then year, then by color, etc. 
the, the particular classification scheme chosen for the cars is subjective. In contrast, human languages which have common ancestors and are derived by descent with modification generally can be classified in an objective nested hierarchies. Nobody would reasonably argue that Spanish should be categorized with German instead of with Portuguese. The difference between classifying cars and classifying languages lies in the fact that with cars, certain characters, for example, color or manufacture, must be considered more important than other characters in order for the classification to work. Hmm. Which types of car characters are more important depends on the personal preference of the individual who's performing the classification. In other words, certain types of characters must be weighed subjectively in order to classify cars in nested hierarchies. Cars do not fall into natural, unique, objective nested hierarchies. Therefore, since common descent is a genealogical process, common descent should produce organisms that can be organized into objective nested hierarchies. Now I want you to think about what are the criteria for objective? He's given examples, but has he given you any actual criteria? How do you know it's objective? Equivalently, we predict that, in general, cladistic analysis of organisms should produce phylogenies that have large, statistically significant values of hierarchical structure. In standard scientific practice, a result with high statistical significance is a result that has a 1% probability or less of occurring by chance. As a representation of universal common descent, the universal tree of life should have very high, very significant hierarchical structures and phylogenetic signal. Confirmation. Most existing species can be organized rather easily in a nested hierarchical classification. This is evident in the use of the Linnaean classification scheme. Keep in mind Linnaeus was a creationist. So apparently, the Linnaean classification scheme didn't actually require Linnaeus to become an evolutionist. So already we're overstating slightly the persuasive power. Based on shared derived characters, closely related organisms can be placed in one group, such as a genus. Several genera can be grouped together into one family. Several families can be grouped together into an order, etc. Potential falsification. And this is important because, of course, if you can't falsify something, then it has no predictive value and it really doesn't help you as a theory, certainly a scientific theory you would like to be able to say that things will happen in, in order A rather than in order B, C, D, etc. And if you can't say that, then you don't have any predictive value to the theory. On the other hand, if you do have predictive value to the theory, then it can be falsified because you can show that instead of order A, you have order B or C or D. It would be very problematic if many species were found that combine characteristics of different nested groupings. So I want you to notice this. It would be very problematic if many species were found that combine characteristics of different nested groupings. Proceeding with the previous example, some nonvascular plants could have seeds or flowers like vascular plants, but they do not. Gymnosperms that conifers or pines, occasionally could be found with flowers, but they never are. Non-seed plants like ferns could be found with woody stems. However, only some angiosperms have woody stems. Hmm. But not all angiosperms. So do we, is woody stem a classification? Interesting to think about. Conceivably, some birds could have memory glands or hair. Some mammals could have feathers. They are an excellent means of insulation. Certain fish or amphibians could have differentiated or cusped teeth. 
but these are only characteristics of mammals. A mix and match of characters like this would make it extremely difficult to objectively organize species into nested hierarchies. Unlike organisms, cars do have a mix and match of characters, and this is precisely why a nested hierarchy does not flow naturally from a classification of cars. Okay? We're going to have some fun with this, I think. <clears throat> If it were impossible or very problematic to place species in an objective nested classification scheme, as it is for car, chair, book, atomic element, and elementary particle examples mentioned above, macroevolution would be effectively disproven. We're getting bold here. More precisely, if the phylogenetic tree of all life gave statistically significant low values of phylogenetic signal, hierarchical structure, common descent would be resolutely falsified. Yes? Pardon me? Um, yes, they do know. In fact, they um, uh, George Gaylord Simpson actually invented a word called mega evolution, which is evolution uh, above the family level. And uh, uh, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, yes, they do except when they don't want creationists to make their points well, and then they protest the use of the word. If, uh, I think that's a fair way of saying it. Yes, macroevolution macro is definitely part of the uh, verbiage. In fact, it is possible to have a reciprocal pattern from nested hierarchies. Mathematically, nested hierarchy is the result of specific correlations between certain characters of organisms. When evolutionary rates are fast, characters become randomly distributed, distributed with the respect to one another, and the correlations are weakened. However, the characters can also be anti-correlated. It is possible for them to be correlated in the opposite direction from what produces nested hierarchies. Archie and Faith and Cranston, so they have a bunch of references there. The Observation of such an anti-correlated pattern would be a strong falsification of common descent, regardless of evolutionary rates. Well, let's take a look. One widely used measure of cladistic hierarchical structure is the consistency index. The statistical properties of the CI measure were investigated in a frequently cited paper by Klassen et al., the exact CI value is dependent on the number of taxa in the phylogenetic tree under consideration. In this paper, the authors calculated that what values of CI were statistically significant for various numbers of taxa. Higher values of CI indicated a greater degree of hierarchical structure. As an example, a CI of 0.2 is expected from random data for 20 taxa. Value of 0.3 is, however, sti highly statistically significant. More more interesting for the present point is the fact uh, that a CI of 0 0.1 for 20 taxa is also highly statistically significant, but it is too low. It is indica indicative of anti-cladistic structure. Klassen et al. took 75 CI values from published cladograms in, in 1989, combined from three papers, and noted how they fared in terms of statistical significance. Cladograms used from 5 to 49 different taxa that is, different species. Three of the 75 cladograms fell within the 95% confidence limit for random data, which means they were indistinguishable for random data. All the rest exhibited highly statistically significant values of CI. None exhibited st significant low values. None displayed an anti-correlated, anti-hierarchical pattern. Note. This study was performed before there were measures of statistical significance which would allow researchers to weed out the bad cladograms. 
Of course, um, reviewers might not want bad cladograms to be published, but that's a different issue. Predictably, the three bad data states uh, considered under 10 taxa, it is, of course, more difficult to determine statistical significance with very little data. 75 independent studies from the different researchers on different organisms and genes with high values of CI, P is less than 0.01, is an incredible confirmation with an astronomical degree of combined statistical significance. P is much less than uh, 10 to the minus 300. If the reverse were true, if studies such as this gave statistically significant values of CI, that is, cladistic hierarchical structure, which were lower than that expected from random data, common descent would have been firmly falsified. Okay, keep in mind that one, about 1.5 million species are known currently and that the majority of these species has been discovered since Darwin first stated his hypothesis of common ancestry. Isn't common ancestry older than Darwin? Wasn't Darwin's real contribution uh, natural selection? Um, this is hagiography of the highest degree. Even so, they all have fit the correct hierarchical pattern within the error for, of our methods. Furthermore, it is estimated that only 1 to 10 percent of all living species has ever been cataloged, let alone studied in detail. New species discoveries pour in daily, and each one is a test of the theory of common descent. Well, with that kind of a statement, you would kind of expect that um, everything should always follow nested hierarchies. Maybe occasionally there'll be a little trouble, but most of the time, no. So there's been two articles that have recently come out, and one that kind of fits in this area that uh, is a little bit older, and you may bring up anything you want to in this regard. Uh, I'm going to discuss warp-weaving spiders. This is the abstract of the paper. Spiders represent an ancient predatory lineage known for their extraordinary biomaterials, including venoms and silks. These adaptations made spiders key arthropod predators in most terrestrial eco ecosystems. Despite ecological, biomedical, and biomaterial importance, relationships among major spider lineages remain unresolved or poorly supported. I thought there was a nice nested hierarchy. that was obvious and that was highly statistically significant. Relationships among major spider lineages remain unresolved or poorly supported. Oops. Current working hypotheses for a spider backbone phylogeny are largely based on morphological evidence, as most molecular markers currently employed are generally inadequate for resolving deeper level relationships. Does that mean we haven't done enough of them, or does that mean they don't really fit in a nested hierarchy? I'll leave that to you. We present here a phylogenomic analysis of spiders, including taxa representing all major spider lineages. Our robust phylogenetic hypothesis recovers some fundamental and uncontroversial spider clades, but rejects the prevailing paradigm of a monophyletic orbicularia the most diverse lineage in containing orb-weaving spiders. Based on our results, the orb web either evolved much earlier than previously hypothesized and is ancestral for a majority of spiders, or it has multiple independent origins, as hypothesized by precladistic authors. In other words, orb weaving <coughs> does not follow this nested hierarchical structure. Cribolate dinopod orb weavers that use mechanically adhesive silk are more closely related to a diverse clade of mostly webless spiders than to the aranioid orb weaving spiders that use adhesive droplet silks. 
The fundamental shift in our understanding of spider phylogeny proposed here has broad implications <coughs> Excuse me. Broad implications for interpreting the evolution of spiders, their remarkable biomaterials, and a key extended phenotype, the spider web. And if you want the address, it's there. It's also in the email I sent. Interesting. And this is commentary on that article by Nature. And it's entitled, Spider Gene Study Reveals Tangled Evolution. Arachnid family tree suggests that many spider species evolved away from web weaving. There's more than one way to catch a fly. Spider webs look like the perfect trap for ensnaring insects, but a spider tree of life based on hundreds of genes suggests many spiders jettisoned the web in favor of other ways of capturing prey. The new studies overturn decades-old dogma we thought we had a nested hierarchy. We don't. By showing that spiders that weave orb-shaped webs are not all close kin, with some spiders more related to species, with some species more related to species that catch prey differently. They are awesome spider webs. They're just not the pinnacle of spider evolution that we thought, said Jason Bond, evolutionary biologist at Auburn University whose team determined the evolutionary relationships of spiders by analyzing more than 300 genes in 33 families. The paper and a similar study from an independent team are both published this week in Current Biology. Scientists have so far named around 45,000 spider species grouped into more than 100 families. The spiders that spin orb-shaped webs belong to two main families, aranioids such as garden spiders, and the more obscured uh, dinopoids, which include ogre face spiders. The two groups spin webs out of chemically distinct silks, or anioids weave a sticky fiber that is made more efficiently than the drier webs of dinopoids, which entangle things with um, uh, simply a lot of extra fibers. But because the groups weave webs similarly, Arachnologists have long put the two together on the spider family tree in a group called orbicularians. But now, molecular family trees made by comparing DNA differences in hundreds of matching genes in numerous spiders paint a very different picture. It looks like it's arbitrary whether you use weeb uh, web weaving and classify them that way or whether you use the DNA or is that objective that we use DNA now I'll leave that for your consideration although the findings support many previous ideas about spider family relations, such as the distinctiveness of trapdoor spiders, which build subterranean traps of dirt, silk, and plants. Orb-weaving arachnoids and dinopoids seem to be more distantly related than previously thought. A team led by evolutionary biologist Rosa Fernandez of Harvard University in Cambridge comes to the same conclusion using a tree forged from more than 2,000 genes in 12 spider families. Despite their web-weaving behavior, dinopoids are more closely related to families that include wolf spiders and crab spiders, which tend to sneak up on their prey, than to aranoids, the researchers report. That discovery leaves two possible explanations for the evolution of the spider web. Well, there's a third one, and that is it was designed, and design can cut across uh, families, but we'll leave that one out. Um, <coughs> either it emerged from much either it emerged much earlier than scientists thought in a common ancestor of many spider families and was later abandoned by some species, as most researchers used to believe, or web spinning and the capacity to spin silk could have evolved multiple times. Does this falsify evolution? Well, no, not really. Maybe it just evolved twice. Fernandez says that both theories are viable and that only genetic data from more spider families will settle the question. And how will that settle the question? I'm not sure. 
Bond, however, favors the idea of very ancient web weaving behavior that was lost over the course of evolution. Notice his reasoning. The suite of behaviors required for web weaving seem too complicated to have evolved over and over again, he says. You don't say. On the basis of their findings, Bond and his team suggest that the orb-shaped spider web emerged in the lower Jurassic between 187 and 201 million years ago, and that ancestors of many spiders abandoned web weaving in favor of other strategies for capturing prey. But why would a spider give up orb weaving? Notice the really clear explanation. <laughs> Evolution is unpredictable. Uh, responds uh, Kuntner, an evolutionary biologist at the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, and um, I won't try that. Uh, a symmetric orb is pretty, but it may only be the ideal architecture of a subset of environments and for a subset of prey the spiders are after. So, sometimes you keep them, sometimes you lose them. Paul Selden, arachnid paleontologist at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, also thinks the web has been abandoned by many spiders. Already catches flying insects, but it advertises to a predator that there's a spider there, he says. The more advanced spiders have gotten rid of it and developed something else. Interesting. You always thought that um, orb weaving spiders were the epitome of spiders. Apparently not. Not because it's difficult to, uh, it's not difficult to do, but because um, it might not be the best strategy. Now, that's our story on herb weaving spiders. Interesting. So what happens to our nice, neat little box that has nested hierarchies that, well, looks like it's a little strained. Um, yeah. Yes, you have to think outside the box. <coughs> now we're going to talk about ocelli in birds. Or, um, um, the most striking uh, feature of peafowl peacocks, etc., is the male's elaborate train which exhibits axillae, ornamental eye spots, that are under sexual selection. Now I want you to notice something. There has been a study showing that the peahens don't really care about how many eye spots there are. Which means that they're not under sexual selection. But they have to be under some kind of selection, otherwise they couldn't have had this kind of perfection. And you know it isn't that uh, God selected them, it, so it must have been that the, that the peahen selected them. But anyway, two additional genera within the uh, Phasianidae, that um, is uh, Polyplectron and Argosianus, exhibit oxali. But the appearance and location of these ornamental eye spots exhibits substantial variation among these genera, raising the question of whether ocelli are hom homologous. That's a fancy way of saying maybe they evolved three times differently. Within polyplectron, uh, ocelli are ancestral, suggesting ocelli may have evolved even earlier prior to the divergence among genera. However, it remains unclear whether Pavo, Polyplectron, and Argusianus form a monophyletic clade in which Aceli evolved once. Did they evolve once or did they evolve three times? We estimate the phylogeny of the acelated species using sequences from 1996 ultra-conserved elements and three mitochondrial regions. So we're going to find out that you can trust the genetic information or you can trust the eye spots. Is that an objective choice? And uh, by the way, there's the um, 
a web, uh, website for the, this is the abstract, and the article, of course, can be purchased if you want. The three oscillated genera, <coughs> the three oscillated genera did form a strongly supported clade. But each oscillated genus was a sister to at least one genus without ocelli. They don't form a nested hierarchy. Indeed, polyplectron and galloperdix, a genus not previously suggested to be related to any oscillated taxa, were sister genera. The close relationship with, between taxa with and without ocelli suggests multiple gains or losses. Independent gains, possibly reflecting a pre-existing bias for eye-like structures among females and or for the existence of a simple mutational pathway for the origin of ocelli, appears to be the most likely explanation. Of course, um, we're familiar with design that can take cup holders and transfer them from Cadillacs to Mercedes to um, Hyundai's to eventually Toyota Corollas. Anybody can have that. Cup holders. That, of course, is a design inference. So there apparently is another uh, mechanism besides the one they propose. And this is a commentary by uh, somebody who is kind of leaning in the creation direction. When a peacock spreads out its train, the feathers form a huge display. Near the end of each feather is a colorful circular object that looks something like an eye. And the feathers are positioned just right so that the eyes or ocelli are beautifully arrayed across the entire display. The iridescence of the eyes comes not from the material itself, which isn't colorful, but from its finely tuned nanostructure, which reflects the light to produce the different colors. Such eye spot features are found in three different bird genera, and according to a new evolutionary analysis of their genetics, they would likely sh share a common ancestor, as has always been expected by evolutionists. There's only one problem. The analysis also finds that other bird genera that are without these ornamental eye spots are also closely related to these genera that do have eye spot features. Maybe the peahens uh, or the females in that one just didn't care about the eye spots. But wait a minute. The peahens don't really care about peacock eye spots either. So why weren't those lost? If these other genera are so closely related, then why do they not also have ocelli? With evolution, we must say that they had some eye spot features but later lost them for some reason over the course of evolution. Or that the eye spot feathers evolved independently in the different genera that have them. Either way, these are just so stories manufactured to fit the theory. As the new study concludes, the close relationship between taxa with and without ocelli suggests multiple gains or losses. Independent gains possibly reflecting a pre-existing bias for eye-like structures among females and or the existence of a simple mutational pathway for the origin of ocelli appears to be the most likely explanation. Come again. The existence of a simple mutational pathway for the origin of ocelli. How many mutations do you think it takes to form one of those eyes? To destroy it, pretty easy. To form it. This is yet another evidence in a long, long list which demonstrates that evolution is not a simple parsimonious explanation that in a stroke easily explains a set of disparate and otherwise unlikely or confusing observations. Rather, evolution is a complex theory with a never-ending list of epicycles that are needed to explain a wide variety of evidence that are inconsistent with the basic theory. This makes evolution a tautology. That's Cornelius Hunter's opinion. This would not be complete without mention of stick insects. This is an article in the journal Nature. The evolution of wings was a central adaptation allowing insects to escape predators, exploit scattered resources, and disperse into new niches, resulting in radiations into vast numbers of species. Despite the presumed evolutionary advantages associated with full-size wings, Macroteri. Nearly all pterygoat winged in, uh, orders have many partially winged uh, brachyteris or wingless apteris lineages. 
And some entire orders are secondarily wingless. For example, fleas, lice, glioblatids, and mantophasmids. With about 5% of extant pterygoid species being flightless. Thousands of independent translation, transitions from a winged form to winglessness have occurred. During the course of insect evolution. Now why are they saying that? It's because insect wings do not form a nice nested hierarchy. Oh! However, an evolutionary reversal from a flightless to a volant form has never been de demonstrated clearly for any pterygoat lineage. Such a reversal is considered highly unlikely because complex interactions between nerves, muscles, sclerites, and wing foils are required to accommodate flight. So it's very difficult to evolve winged flight, so it must have evolved only once. Uh, here we show that stick insects order phasmotidae diversified as wingless insects and that wings were derived secondarily, perhaps on many occasions. In fact, the article goes on to suggest that there were 42 times in stick insects alone. These results suggest that wing development pathways are conserved in wingless phasmids. In other words, you lose the wings, but you keep all the genetic material so you can re-evolve them at a moment's notice. And that re-evolution of wings has had an unrecognized role in insect diversification. Now remember, the big claim that was being made was that everything fits into a nested hierarchy. And because everything fits into a nested hierarchy, that we should accept evolution as the most likely cause. Well, what happens? I, I, I think that evolution should give rise to nested hierarchies. That makes sense. But what happens if um, the existence of non-nested hierarchies happens? Is that evidence against evolution? It would seem so. And we've looked at three examples, and there are others. Or weaving spiders, ocelli and birds, and insect wings. Evolution has commonly refused to recognize evi uh, evidence against evolution. I have, not, I have not yet seen anybody to say, this puts the theory of evolution under strain. They say, well, maybe it happened this way, maybe it happened that way. There's no consideration to maybe evolution isn't true in any of those articles. And I would submit that if you have evidence that is filtered, of course it is statistically significant. S significant. But mm -hmm. it is statistically significant precisely because it's not random data. It's filtered data. And anybody can filter data and make it statistically significant. But that's my take. <coughs> now it's your turn. Um, yes, we have a couple of them up there and one there. Okay, Could, go ahead. Couldn't, uh, couldn't physical requirements uh, of the environment uh, create an appearance of nested hierarchy? Uh, for example, um, for those organisms that want to, that, you know, that need to raise uh, children uh, over a long period of time for, uh, to allow them to uh, gain skills through, through learning from the environment. Uh, rather than just, you know, innate uh, stemming from the genes, um, that they might want to have them be close to the mother and provide warmth so that they don't have to, you know, use up all of that energy. And, but that warmth might require hair, and you can imagine any other things that all sort of clump together to provide that sort of environment for the young. Well, yes, and if you were designing such organisms, you might, uh, you might uh, have... Uh, similar design patterns for all of them. And of course that's one of the weaknesses right there is that is that the claim that only evolution can account for nested hierarchies is just um, it's incorrect to begin with. But as you can see if you have completely contradictory evidence 
it doesn't phase them. So, yeah, I. this is more propaganda than it is objective analysis. And especially the, the common ancestor, you know, so, okay, it's not working with this cladistic structure, so you hypothesize a, a common ancestor you could push further and further on down, you know, almost constantly chasing them. Yeah, if you really can't believe that the wings evolved all at once, then the easiest way to do that is to say they evolved once and then they spread to all insect genera and then the ones that found them useful used them and the ones that didn't, didn't use them and de degraded the information. Um, that's an essentially unfalsifiable uh, hypothesis. The only problem with that hypothesis is how did it happen the first time? Um, it's a little difficult to envision, uh, envision how that would work. Uh, many interesting comments can be made. I think you've touched on probably the, the basic one, uh, and that is uh, if a creator was creating various types of organisms, uh, would he avoid nested uh, hierarchies? Uh, I mean, y y you're asking the impossible here almost, and that uh, if you're designing something for a certain purpose in one organism, you design something for another purpose, for the same purpose in another organism, there might be some similarities there. There might even uh, be some genetic similarities. The, 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 basic, uh, the basic premise here is, is just, you know, it's, it's vacuous. Well, it's, 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 more than, <coughs> it's more than that it's just vacuous. It's also that there appear to be falsifications that are not taken seriously. Yeah, and as examples, let, let me, uh, you know, uh, there's a paper out there um, about the evolution of the eye where they think maybe the eye evolved uh, as many as 65 times because uh, it doesn't fit the evolutionary pattern, the normal. And let me give you a couple examples here. You have some very closely related organisms that have very different kinds of eyes like um, the chambered nautilus, which has a pin, pinhole type of eye, no lens and so on, very simple type of eye. And then you've got the related octopus that has a very complex eye with uh, focusing mechanisms, a lens and all this stuff. These are very closely related organisms, very different kinds of eyes. What happened to nested uh, hypothesis or there, there or hierarchies there in that situation. Uh, then you got some very different kind of organisms, the very distantly related organisms who have the very same kind of eye. Uh, I think sea cucumbers have a have an eye that's very similar to that of uh, uh, that of vertebrates, if I remember correctly. Uh, basically, it's it's the same, but uh, a s more specific example here would be uh, uh, you have the squid, which is a protostome, and you've got man uh, or whatever bird you want that, that is a uh, deuterostome, and you've got the same kind of eye in both of them. I mean, the similarity of the squid eye to ours, you know, is anatomically is, is striking. Uh, Except that our retina is backwards. Well, <laughs> uh, the uh, anatomy is striking. Uh, no, a, it is. It's, it's got a lens. It's got a, a round uh, eye. It's, it's got a, a retina. Everything cornea, is it's focusing and so on. It's very, very similar. Uh, yet, you know, these are basically two different, entirely different phylogenetic patterns and, and uh, uh, deuterostome and protostome, you can hardly be different, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, relationship. How do they get so, to be so similar? And well, do you have another problem, for example, with um, bats, <coughs> birds, and uh, uh, pterodactyls? And the... 
birds are is striking enough, but the bats and pterodactyls have a very, very similar structure. You know, long, elongated mm -hmm. fingers with, with uh, webs stretched between them. And th then you've got another example of where advanced organisms uh, have simple eyes and simple organisms have advanced eyes. Uh, as an example of that, there's a teeny little worm. It's only about eight millimeters long. It's a polychaete worm. And it's got two eyes that bug out in front of his body. Uh, muscles that move those eyes around. That worm is not just seen as light or dark, you know. It's, it's looking at stuff and it's able to move those eyes around. Does it have lenses and stuff like that, if I it remember It There's a lens and there's a gland in there that is supposed to help in the focus. It, it's like, what is, a, what is an eye like that doing in a worm like that? <laughs> yes. And then you get to Amphioxus, <laughs> which is in the chordates, which is the most advanced uh, uh, phylum we have and it doesn't have it has uh, you know a light sensitive cells in its notochord I uh, uh, near its notochord and uh, uh, that, that's all there is to it you know so uh, what bothers me about uh, this argument you presented today here is that uh, uh, at the beginning there they tried to put this into uh, mathematical rigor of probability and so on and uh, they didn't have a basis I mean obviously they didn't have a basis for doing that uh, when you looked at the case beyond that it was just purely selective uh, data and but a student doesn't know this and uh, uh, well, this, is, this is so often done in, in uh, evolution and so on you, yeah. you, you refer to mathematics, and then, of course, the student turns his mind off because he's not used to that language. And uh, they get away with uh, uh, mathematical rigor, which doesn't exist. Well, let me, let me illustrate. Let's supposing that we threw out a bunch of dies. And I went through, and I picked out all the sixes. And I put them all in a box. And I asked, uh, let's say we had, you know, a thousand eyes, well, let's say six thousand eyes. So we have now a thousand six, uh, sixes all in, on a, in one setting. You look at that and you, you ask the question, what is the probability of all those sixes coming up uh, at once? Well, it's actually quite low. It's uh, six to the thousandth power, which is you know, one of those fantastic numbers that you see. Um, but does that mean it's considerably higher than 10 to the 300th power, by the way? But does that mean that this particular die has a predilection to landing on six? Or does it actually mean that you've selected the data, and when you selected the data, of course, it comes out statistically significant? Remember, all you can falsify with a standard uh, falsification of the null hypothesis is that you have a fair die that has been rolled so many times without any selection applied. As soon as you start applying selection, of course it's going to be statistically significant. But it has nothing to do with whether the die is fair or not. It has to do with whether the selection is fair or not. And we know the selection is not fair. So when you see people using that, those kinds of numbers, can you publish? It was interesting. The spiders did not form a well-divided group according to the article. They even had a reference for that. If the spiders don't form a well-divided group, then wouldn't you want to include that in your your probabilities and wouldn't the spiders come out with a less than highly probable uh, cladistic analysis but you see what's been used is the selected ones that manage to pass because they're positive uh, positive studies now we have one here and then a couple of them over here go ahead what relationships could one find in an aquatic animal that evolved into a land animal 
that evolved into an aquatic animal? Interesting question. Where are you going to put it on the tree? Well, obviously, how they reproduce is more important than where they live. You see, how they reproduce is objective. Where they live is subjective. That's why I asked, how do you define objective and subjective? In my years of, of studying birds, uh, I'm going to have to go back and rethink a lot after today. Uh, there are sun greaves, sun bitterns, dollar birds that have wing spots. I'm going to have to put those in with the peacocks because I never thought about putting things with eye spots. And now my moths and butterflies with eye spots are going to be related to the peacocks and have to be in one of these boxes. So you've completely blown all that research I've done in my life out the window. If eye spots are important, and what about reptiles that have eye spots on their tails? You know, I mean, we've got some real problems. Are they more closely associated with the uh, peacocks than the, uh, than the birds with eye spots? Uh, they're in the same group as caterpillars with eye spots. I, okay. <laughs> Well, that helps. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Well, I was, I'm curious as to the before, before the fall, basically there was, as we know, there was no death. So creatures that ran around had to be essentially vegetarian. And if you have all these different models of spiders, some that capture by orbs with sticky and non-sticky, and some that use trap doors, and some that hunt, and some that have little webs that on their that capture nets. Uh, how did that? How did that? How did they basically decide to become to, to diverge into a, into different um, food sources? I don't know the answer to that, and part of the reason I don't know the answer to that is I'm not sure how far down the the animal chain vegetarianism was carried. Um, uh, I don't know of any vegetarian spiders. There are vegetarian bugs that suck fruit ju or, or plant juices. Um, the, were spiders originally vegetarian and then developed all this other stuff? And if so, something must have helped them develop it because herb weaving is not an easy thing to create. Uh, was that done at the fall? Was that done when the devil decided to do some um, genetic experiments? And if so, why don't we have the original spiders? I don't have the answers to that. I, uh, one of the things that I think that we need to keep in mind is people are trying to decide this on the basis of science. The science is kind of selected. Um, I don't think it's nearly as objective as these people like to think. On the other hand, that doesn't mean we don't have problems with our uh, reconstructions either. And so the truth of the matter is that although you can have some hints in one direction, and I think, for example, the origin of life is a really, really strong hint. Um, None of it is, is ironclad enough that you can't doubt. And I suspect that that's the way the Creator wanted it. That we could always, if we really didn't like what was going on, we could always find some excuse not to believe. And that the real problem here is not so much a scientific problem as it is a heart problem and that the scientific problem is deliberately left there specifically so that we do have the free choice to decide which way we want to go on that. At least that's my opinion. 
Um, yeah, we can get you a mic here. Go ahead. How much conflict is there within the scientific community about these types of things? Are, are they having trouble with each other? Well, they're having trouble in some ways. They're trying to figure out what it is. And I think most people would say the molecular data trumps the morphologic data. Um, that is to say, if the genes, the, the sequence of genes is the same or closely the same, that that's more important than the, than the fact that they don't look alike. Um, and that's why uh, the question of what's objective data, it comes down to, you know, what do you think is the most important uh, part of the classification scheme you're going to use? Um, and you'll, fi you'll find papers arguing one way, you'll find papers arguing another way, and a lot of times they both have a good point and it's not really clear who is correct. Or maybe they're both not correct, or they're both partly correct. Um, but one thing you will never catch them doing is saying, uh, you know, maybe this is designed. I'll give you the best example I can. There's been a huge debate over whether there's a tree of life or not. And Way towards the, twi the, the ends, most people will say there is. But at the very beginning, there's a lot of people that say, well, the bacteria were exchanging genes with each other right and left, and so you can't really follow bacteria by what kind of genes they have because they're cannibalizing genes from other bacteria or not really cannibalizing, they're, they're accepting genes from other bacteria. So, so you find something that's in a, you know, E. coli and you find something that's in a thermophilus and they're identical, well, maybe they just exchange genes. Uh, by the time you get done with that, you don't have a tree of life at the, be at the beginning. You have more like a web. Nobody is stopping and saying, well, maybe God made it and he put whatever genes he wanted to and whatever organisms he wanted to. And the fact that these two happen to have the identical gene just means that that's the way God fixed it. Um, so you will find them debating over who's ancestral to who. What you will not ever find them debating is over whether this is designed or not. Design is the one hypothesis that you can rule out at the beginning. I think it's probably important to keep in mind that uh, there's been a striking conflict uh, between the genetic information, the genetic patterns and the traditional classification. Uh, so many times one runs into a conflict between the, what the organism looks like and its genetic makeup. Uh, this has been going on for 20, 30 years here since they've been sequencing DNA. Eye spots and, uh, it, uh, and web weaving are just two examples of that. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's striking throughout the, the literature how different those two are, and it tells you uh, something is wrong here than the, the basic premise. Are you going to, which one are you going to follow? Are you going to follow morphology or are you going to follow uh, DNA? And sometimes it gets even worse than that because it's a question of which DNA you follow. If you follow these three genes, why it gives you a, a one branch, uh, or one branching diagram. Mitochondrial DNA, or do you go to the other stuff? Yeah, and, it, uh, and at that point you're going, mm -hmm. that's why I ask, what is objective about this scenario? But we are not without uh, problems on our side also in terms of predation. A question was raised here uh, about this, and I think it's, uh, uh, we don't have a good answer, but I think it's important for us to point that out. Uh, we tend to think of an idyllic uh, world at the beginning that had no predation, and they, 
no death, some go into no death, and uh, we all know that when Adam ate an apple, he killed all kinds of cells in that apple. Uh, so that's one end of the scale. So do plants count for death? Do uh, bacteria count for death? And uh, do insects count for death? I think those are three uh, important questions that we don't really have a good answer. Well, I think we do have a good answer for plants. Yes, plants were designed for animal food. Yeah, no question about that. You know. But, and, uh, you know, you go to Venus, fly, Venus Five Harp, you have some animals plant designed for plant. Uh, just a little sidelight throw in. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but, uh, uh, no, I, I think we need to uh, keep in mind here. Uh, there are questions. Let's take the baleen of the whale, made for trapping uh, krill. You know, th this is... Uh, this is their diet uh, of some of the whales, uh, most of the whales. Well, I'm going to uh, say more than that. Right now, humpback whales are well known for finding a school of fish, blowing air mm -hmm. around it, and then coming up in the middle of it with their mouths open and <coughs> scooping up all the fish they can. Uh, get to... Uh, it gets past krill. Yeah, but, but you get to, to the spider orb. I mean, this is, uh, I, I just marvel at, at, that a spider, teeny little animal and so on, uh, can sit there and engineer uh, where he's going to put this thing uh, and uh, drop down lines to it and weave a, a web that is incredible. Uh, did God have in mind the uh, keeping some flies under control, I would appreciate that myself. <laughs> and, um, uh, so, uh, sometimes this is presented as, you know, a puzzle. In fact, we went through a manuscript that pointed that out recently. Uh, uh, this is a real puzzle. I'm not sure that, you, you know, it's not a puzzle if, unless you dogmatically uh, adopt certain viewpoints that uh, you can't demonstrate. Uh, how far up the scale are you going to go? I don't know. There are remarkable uh, abilities to regenerate among some of the uh, amphibians. Uh, well, reproduce a whole leg if it's taken off. I mean, this is, uh, uh, we appreciate that very much, you know, but uh, uh, were legs made to be uh, bitten off and uh, the original plan? Uh, we're not so happy with that. Uh, but I think that uh, we don't know for sure, but um, there is sufficient evidence for design that we know which side uh, design uh, supports in, in this controversy. One other thing I think I would point out in this, in this um, is that <coughs> The fact of design is completely separate from the emotives of the designer. Um, AK-47s are meant for killing people. They're not meant for hunting deer. They're not meant for, they're meant for killing people. They're a very effective design, a very wicked design. But saying that, that, that they were not made by a good God does not mean that they weren't designed. Same way with stupid design. Pintos had a gas tank in a place where if they had a rear end collision, they would explode. It's not a good design, but that doesn't mean that there weren't some engineers at Ford that created those things. All we have when we point out a bad design is to say that the hypothesis that God's in his heaven and all is right with the world is not a good hypothesis. God may be in his heaven, but all assuredly is not right with the world. And I, frankly, I think that the great controversy <coughs> goes great ways towards explaining malevolent design. Um, malaria parasites are very good at getting inside of people's red blood cells and eating up the hemoglobin and dis dis 
dispatching the remains into very carefully designed uh, uh, receptacles that they can eventually get rid of all of that bilirubin. Um, it's wonderful design, except when it happens in you, in which case you think it's terrible design. But it's, but the fact that it's, the fact that it's there, uh, the fact that it's malevolent design does not mean that it isn't designed. It just means that we need more designers, um, or a designer who is willing to uh, be harder on us than we would like. Um, I don't, I s don't, I don't see how you can use that as an argument against the fact of design, to be fair. Uh, you don't stumble across those things. Uh, you don't cook up malaria parasites on your own. Somebody has to make certain things very carefully in order to make it work. I would point out that uh, parasitism may not be as bad as we think, of course. We've got symbiosis, we've got mutualism, uh, you know, where algae and fungi work together and so on uh, very nicely. And um, furthermore, each one of us was a parasite on our mother when we were incubating for nine months. What a terrible thing. Huh? Uh, <laughs> We're all parasites. Uh, nature is very complex out there. Well, uh, we have one more comment here. Uh, my question has to do with uh, what we were just talking about with the uh, malevolent design. And uh, recently I was reading uh, back in Patriarchs Profits. Prophets, uh, Specifically, she was talking about uh, where Moses was uh, before Pharaoh, and uh, he was uh, showing, uh, you know, signs from God to Pharaoh to, uh, you know, try to convince him to uh, let the children of Israel go. And Pharaoh had his magicians coming in and and doing certain things, you know, with the uh, creating or, you know, uh, pretending to create uh, certain things that snakes being one snakes, of them. you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But she said specifically in there that uh, Satan can't actually create anything. Uh, only God can. So that Moses, when he cast his rod down and, and the snake ate the other ones, that was his demonstration that that was an actual real creation from God and that the others were only fake. They, they weren't, they were, um, like any magician, they were... Uh, sleight of hand, they, they weren't real. So how could the devil then actually be able to get into like our, um, how, how to put it, to actually be able to transform existing or, or, or things but a malevolent design that would then well, be I, real? I don't know all of the devil's power. Um, I'm probably thankful that I don't, but what I do know is that um, we as people are able to put insulin genes into yeast. We are not only able to put insulin genes into yeast, but we are able to put glargine insulin and uh, various other things like that. In other words, we can take and we can actually tweak the molecules. <coughs> so, uh, when that happens, um, I don't think that um, um, I, I think that if the devil has our power, then he could take and genetically engineer stuff. Now, maybe he doesn't, maybe he does. Maybe he's smarter at it than we are. I don't know. That's one of the things I guess we can ask God when, in the new earth, is exactly how far does it go? But um, what I can say is if we can tweak nature, there's no reason for the devil not to be able to tweak nature in somewhat the same way. In fact, uh, there's no reason for him not to be able to do animal breeding like we do, 
only with perhaps more malevolent uh, intent. Maybe wolves were bred out of dogs rather than vice versa. Mark Twain had said there are three kinds of lies. Lie, damn lie, and statistics. You can prove anything you want to almost with statistics. So when the freshman class comes to the classroom, the teacher can blow off their minds with all kinds of mathematical equations and statistics. I uh, just wanted to ask if you folk know of any mutations that are beneficial to an organism. Has it been proven in medicine, for example? It seems to be that mutations, at, especially with human diseases, detrimental always to human beings. Well, it depends on what you mean by beneficial. Well, some uh, of the yeast that has insulin genes actually is a protected species for very good reasons, and but will therefore grow. Uh, but that's because of humans in the environment that want the insulin right, that comes but from it. Right, hasn't Eli Lilly put that into the uh, organism, or has it just happened by itself? Well, this is an interesting question, because uh, one of the things that we see that happens all the time is that uh, the wild type, in general, will outcompete, uh, let's say, MRSA. In humans, it doesn't, because we take antibiotics and kill off all the wild type. But if you take the antibiotics away, uh, the wild type actually outcompetes. And I've seen this happen several times in my career uh, with, for example, Septra uh, or Bactrim, uh, sulfamethoxazole plus trimethoprim. And when it first came out, it killed everything. Then after a while, the organisms got resistant to it and we couldn't use it anymore. So people stopped using it. Then after a while, the organisms that were not resistant grew faster, and so they should be dominated in the environment, and, uh, and it's now, uh, and, it, and it became more of a mainstream drug again. And then and now, we're having the second round of resistance coming up. And if we stop using it, then there will be a third round and a fourth round, because in fact, the mutations that enable septra or enable bacteria to resist septra um, are harder on the organism in general. They don't grow as fast. And so the ones that are susceptible grow faster as long as there's not septra in the environment. Um, and that's true for penicillinase producing stuff. That's true for MRSA. That's true for all of these superbugs. If a, it's harder on the people who are actually infected by them because now what do you do to kill it? But in fact, um, the organisms themselves don't grow as well. Could it be also because um, that the medical community largely has used it, abused it in a way that it should not be and then these uh, organisms got smarter and then all these medications are also advertised very heavily uh, and so there's an expectation, I came to you and you didn't can you give me an antibiotic, what's wrong with you? Oh, that's definitely true. Uh, what happened was that antibiotics turned out to make animals grow faster because they don't have to fight the bacteria as much. And so they started giving antibiotics to bacteria all the time. And of course that predictably produced resistance. Um, uh, so it's, it's not just doctors who are doing it, it's veterinarians who are doing it. Um, and it's the common people. You know, in Mexico, you buy the antibiotics over the counter. You get a sore throat. Um, I had somebody who was, who was taking antibiotics in Peru. We don't even know why. Uh, they came up here. They didn't have antibiotics. They wanted me to prescribe them, and unfortunately, I couldn't prescribe them anyway. Uh, the person left everything alone, and as far as I know, is doing well. So uh, there's a lot of overuse of antibiotics in places where uh, physicians don't control it, as well as in places where physicians do. It's not just the physicians, it's everybody. Because we all want to take the pill and get better. And it doesn't always work that way. Uh, and, it, it, and it is smart to not use them unless you need them, and then of course to use them when you need them. Um, but that doesn't 
give everybody, including it doesn't give all doctors, total smarts. Anyway, I think that uh, this is a good place to stop. And um, you know, come back next week, and we'll have some more fun. And um, uh, uh, as you go around, look for places where this kind of thing has happened and nobody's saying anything about it because this idea that we can fit everything into a nested hierarchy, it just isn't necessarily so.